Hello, my name is David Hillier and I will be presenting for the next 15 minutes a small lecture on agency theory. Now, this is for my students at the University of Strathclyde and I am using the slides for my book, which is Corporate Finance. The sections uh, and chapters I'll be covering today is Chapter 2, Sections 2.2 and 2.3, but principally the lecture will be about agency theory and the way in which agency theory changes the structure of companies. Now, there are two types of agency relationships in a company. And before we, we talk about these two types, I just want to define what is meant by an agency relationship. If you own something and you hire someone to manage that asset for you, then you're hiring an agent. And that agent should be acting in your interests. However, there is no way of actually knowing whether that agent will act in your interest because there's a strong urge for agents to act in their own interests rather than the, the interests of those who hire them. And this happens within companies. In companies, the shareholders, who are the owners of the firm, hire managers and directors to run the company. And agency theory looks at the issues relating to this interaction between the managers and the shareholders. So the managers are the agents and the shareholders are the principals in this relationship. Now we have two types of agency relationships that we discuss in the book. The first type is the relationship between managers and shareholders. So shareholders have to ensure that managers are doing the job that they expect them to do. And this means that the shareholders will bring in structures to the company, to the contracts of the managers, to align the manager's interests with that of the shareholders. A type two agency relationship is the relationship between majority shareholders, that, uh, that is shareholders who own most of the shares of the company and minority shareholders. Minority shareholders are those institutions or individuals who in invest their money in a company but only hold a small percentage of shares. So this relationship is like the, the large shareholder versus the small shareholder. Now, if you are a very large shareholder, then you can effectively control the management. And a type two agency relationship is one where the controlling shareholder or the majority shareholder makes the managers take decisions that are in the interests of them at the expense of the minority shareholders or the small shareholders. There is a very large body of research that looks at both of these types of agency relationships and at the end of chapter two you will see a large reading list. I think I put in about 100 papers into that and the other ones those are the papers that I feel are most important in the literature. So if you're wanting to read into corporate governance further, then please have a look at the papers uh, that are listed at the back of the chapter. Now, we have type 1 and we have type 2 agency relationships. This has an impact on the way in which managers are contracted in the firm. With the type 1 agency relationship, shareholders are wanting to ensure that managers are doing what they want. They're, they're, they're wanting managers to make the right investment decisions for the shareholders. That is, to maximise shareholder wealth. Uh, how do you do that? Well, 
One of the ways to do that is through the way in which you pay the managers or the executives of a company, and that is incentive compensation. And there's different types of incentive compensation. You can have long-term incentives, or you can have short-term incentives, or you can just have your base salary. So long-term incentives are incentives that maybe give the manager some equity that they're not allowed to sell and for after a few years. We call that restricted stock. Short-term incentives are bonuses, performance bonuses. Now, in the, the textbook, you, we discuss these in a lot more detail. But for now, I want to just point you to this Mercer um, survey that looked at um, the breakdown in executive remuneration and this is a 2012 presentation and if you go to their website you can download the whole whole document but you can see that there's a, a great difference across different parts of the world and that's really quite interesting in that you know we have a theory and we might have research that is looking at the US for example and it's possible that the findings from that research may not actually apply to elsewhere in the world because, you know, we say that a lot of things are, arise as a result of what is going on within the, within the environment. We say that's an endogenous outcome. So is managerial compensation endogenously determined by what is going on within the, the economic environment? And if that is the case then it's possible that a lot of research that we're seeing in, for example, the US may not be particularly valid in Europe or Asia. Looking at this, you can see that in Europe, um, the, the largest component uh, of salary is long-term incentives, but it's almost the same proportion of overall remuneration as basic salary. And then you can see other parts of the, the world where, like, for example, Asia, which includes India and China, where the largest part of the the, the remuneration is long-term incentives. Now, when I do my executive education throughout the world, and, and I do teach in a lot of places, it was interesting that um, out in Southeast Asia, you know, people, executives were saying to me, well, the reason why you have such a large uh, proportion of uh, remuneration coming from long-term incentives is that people are actually paid very little in general. They're paid much lower in general in, uh, in Asia. And that means that because you're, you're, the salary is much lower, it means then that the long-term incentives as a percentage of your total remuneration is much greater. And that might be something that's, uh, that's valid, I'm not sure. No, I don't think anyone's actually researched into that. But even if you look within Europe, you can see there's quite a bit of variation. So the UK the, you know, has quite a large component of executive remuneration linked into incentives, which suggests that if we assume that salaries are fairly similar across Europe, that UK executives are more incentivized and are more driven to maximise share price performance, more so than, say, um, uh, more, more so than, say, um, what you'd say, you, you know, continental Europe. You look at Sweden, that's, now that's really quite interesting, again, because long-term incentives are massive. And you compare the long-term incentives in Sweden to the short-term incentives to the UK, again, some interesting differences there that researchers uh, will, I'm sure, have already looked at uh, or will look at in the forthcoming years. Another way in which uh, companies are controlled is through the way in which they structure their equity, that is, the, the shares. In a lot of theory, you, you assume that for every share that an individual holds, they would get one vote in an AGM, an annual general meeting. But that doesn't always happen. If you look at this slide, and this, co this comes from a 2005 
um, you know, survey uh, from the Association of British Insurers. And this looks at the percentage of companies within any one country with one share, one vote. And that is, you know, if you have one share, you have one, one vote. So in Belgium, for example, 100% of companies have one share, one vote. But if you look at the Netherlands, um, which is shown here as NL, then only 14% of companies have a one share, one vote system. And, and again, what I would say here is uh, look at the variety across Europe. CH is not China, it's Switzerland. And I'll just, you know, going along the bottom, it's UK, France, Germany, Switzerland, Spain, Italy, Netherlands, Sweden, Belgium, and other. So companies have different classes of shares. And I will, um, you know, well, I... I'll show you this this table, but I won't go into the table in a lot of detail because I'm not got not got much time left in this video. What I would ask you to do is to read about this in the the textbook and read about that in more detail. But again, you can see just one thing, and I'll just talk about the UK. The UK twenty percent of firms have preference shares, and preference shares are a hybrid security that are a mixture of um, equity and of debt and I'll cover that in a later video for a later chapter in the book. So we've looked at uh, executive remuneration, we've looked at shareholder structures, now I'm just going to look at an ownership structure that is you know how companies can be owned and you know I'm just going to give you a, a very quick example there. Now, that this you'll go into this in a lot more detail uh, in the book, but what you if you look at this, if you just look at this at a superficial level, then you have five different main shareholders. You've got Exor, Capital Research Management Company, FMR LLC, and Institutional Investors, and that looks like a, a fairly straightforward ownership structure for Fiat, which is the Italian automaker. But in actual fact, Fiat is owned by the Agnelli family, but the Agnelli family doesn't appear here. So the Fiat ownership structure is actually a lot more complex than you would expect. So, sorry, I'll just, I'll just be explicit about that. The Fiat is controlled by the Agnelli family, and that control is a difference between what is owned. And... I'm not going to go into that in detail here, but what I would do is I'd like to refer you to a number of research studies on pyramids and the listing is at the back of the chapter. And that, that will open up a whole vista of ideas to you when you actually think, well, who actually owns a company? A lot of companies, you can really find it difficult to track down who the ultimate owner is because a lot of investors invest through offshore funds who and it's difficult to find out who those investors are if you try and track it down so that's an area again who owns a company it's very difficult to find out and if you don't know who owns a company you actually don't really know who controls the company and if you don't know who controls the company you don't know how the objectives of managers are formed so Really interesting area. This is one of my main research areas, and it's I spend quite a lot of time thinking about these things. If you think about the ownership structure of companies uh, across the world, this is just a table that comes from La Porta et al. in 2000. Quite an old paper now, and, and when I talk about this paper, a lot of people now say, well, look, things have changed an awful lot, and I, I would accept that. Um, you know, we've had the financial crisis since this happened and, uh, you know, there really has been a lot of change. I would say that the main change in uh, this um, in ownership structure is the increase in foreign shareholders throughout the world. That is foreign, foreign investors investing in different countries. That has really grown. I would also say that the state um, owner, state shareholder ownership has also grown. And that is predominantly as a result of the financial crisis 
and the bailout. That's my timer telling me I have to finish off now. Okay, so again, this is uh, section 2.3 of corporate finance, and you can read more about this, uh, summary of this, uh, in the book. So, quick overview. What is agency theory? It's, it's a relationship between managers and shareholders. That's a type 1 agency relationship. It's the relationship between large shareholders and minority shareholders. That's a type 2 agency relationship. But there are other relationships, for example, shareholders and debt holders. How can we look at that agency relationship? Is that an agency relationship or is it just a relationship? Okay, so what I would like to finish this video off by asking you a question is, do managers act in the interests of shareholders? That's something to think about. Thank you.